this episode of the Film Crux Podcast, we have the creator cinematographer, Oren Sopper. To me, what's exciting about something like the FX3 and the way that we made this film is the idea of the cameras getting smaller mm. the, while maintaining a high image quality. Before, before we get into the creator, though, I, I kind of, well, this is related to it, but I kind of want to know how you got on the project, because I, I, I haven't, I purposely didn't look too much into any of this, because I knew yeah. you were coming on, um, but how did you get onto the project? I know that uh, Greg uh, Fraser was, was on it, and he still is a, a co-cinematographer, um, but how did you get involved with it? Uh, yeah, I got involved with the project with uh, um, the random crazy phone call from Greg, which is something that just happens periodically in my life. Uh, <laughs> something I've been very grateful for. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Greg's been somewhat of a mentor um, and I've been very lucky to, to have that relationship and, and have that grow and foster. And I've done a few odd jobs with him here and there, smaller things. And, and they always start with a random phone call out of the blue uh, and then some crazy pitch for like, hey, I'm doing this project. Like, do you want to come help out with this? Or I'm doing something else. And this project started the same way with with a, a crazy random phone call from Greg, uh, where you never you never quite know what you're gonna get into, but it's always gonna be something exciting and cool. And and this ended up being something quite big, but um yeah, it, it started very unceremoniously, I would say, and then grew from there. I'm uh, jealous. I, I need to get better people to call me. That never <laughs> happens to me. <laughs> In my uh, entire it, career as a filmmaker, that nothing like that has ever happened to me. I mean, it 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 doesn't really happen to to me either. It's just I got very lucky with Greg. Basically, the circumstances that led to it were that Greg had been on board the project for a number of years, uh, talking with Gareth Edwards, who of course he worked with on Rogue One. Right. So they had been talking about this project since then, basically like 2017, on and off, just discussing this hypothetical um, project that they wanted to do that was exploring these ideas of making a big budget project, but with smaller tools and a more indie guerrilla approach. Hmm. Uh, and it's something they explored a little bit on Rogue One, but obviously that's there's such a big machine there that you can only do so much. But So there was always this sort of fantasy of um, going back to something even more pure, I guess, if you want to call it that. Gareth had been working on this script for a while and, and it, it started to take shape. But by the time it came uh, time to shoot it, Greg was a little busy uh, prepping this other project, something um, in the desert. I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, they, yeah, so the prep uh, of Dune Part Two was overlapping with our shoot basically because because our mm. the creator shoot kept shifting because of covid and we were right. shooting in southeast asia and the restrictions were lifting and countries were opening and closing and the, so it was just complicated to um figure out when to actually shoot this thing but by the time it came it came around it um greg was, wasn't going to be able to be on set basically so it just became logistically impossible for greg to kind of be boots on the ground for this project and he um stayed on in a remote capacity and was still working on the project and, and we would collaborate every day very closely, uh, especially in prep, but he needed another DP to basically be um, on set. And Interesting. <laughs> With yeah. any project, obviously there's a huge collaboration on the visuals, um, you know, not to exclude the um, production designer, but typically the, the visuals are heavily influenced by both the director and the cinematographer. Yeah. So um, you're, you're working not only with, the director on this film, but another cinematographer. Tell me about that collaboration, because that's a very interesting and unusual collaboration to happen. We would we would constantly refer to it as like the three pronged brain, like that yeah. that we need to we need to you know talking in in science fiction terms, the three of us really need to focus our time and prep on like mind melding and becoming like the Borg. Like there's a hive mind that is shared among the three of us, and we all need to be able to share the same vision and taste and uh, visual um, acumen and uh, attention to detail and basically like adopt a mutual vision for the film. Mm. And it needs to be shared between the three of us. It's not the type of film where somebody comes in with an idea and then somebody else is like, no, maybe we should do something different. And like, there's no, there was no room for that kind of debate or argument or disagreement or ego. Like we had to, truly just 
create one vision that the three of us shared and were able to tap into. Right. And in this case, it was Gareth's vision. So Gareth is truly just one of the most visionary directors I've ever worked with and came into this project having thought about it for many years with such a clear vision for what it needed to feel like and look like and the texture of it. And there were he had been researching for years and collected thousands of reference images and, and concept art. And I mean, there was a wealth of material to kind of look at to try and understand how Gareth sees this world. Yeah. And Greg and I's job really was to kind of understand that and tap into it and be able to channel it so that when I'm lighting on set and when Greg is looking at dailies and when we're discussing how things are going and checking in on the look of the film and picking our equipment and, and deciding how to approach a scene, it all has to be in service of the vision for the project, which was defined by mm -hmm. Gareth. Because we don't want, I mean, I certainly didn't want to waste Gareth's time on set. Of like he's, he was busy enough. You know, he had a lot on his plate, yeah. uh, as you can imagine. And like my goal, I guess, that I set for myself was like, I don't want to have to bother him or I don't want him to have to like look at something and say, mm, doesn't quite look the way that I imagined it. Like I want to be able to just deliver a look and feel for these spaces and locations that we were filming at. And like every time, you know, Gareth would point the camera at something that he would be happy with how it looks and that it would fit with the ethos and the the style and the look and feel of the film that we that we had talked about in prep. So that was that was really the goal. Yeah. So that that's that's super interesting because it's it's like I said, it's just hard. It's not hard, but it's a it's a collaboration. Filmmaking is a collaborative uh, art yes. form, you know, and that collaboration with the director is is vital between the cinematographer uh, and, and the director. Um, and there are so many different working styles of directors, some that are very hands on with the visuals, some that are very hands off. But then you bring in that extra element of, of somebody remotely also being involved with the visuals. That's just like insane to me. I can't even imagine working in that capacity. Tell, tell me about uh, about like a daily um, process for you guys setting up a shot. Yeah. Well, I think the key uh, detail to mention, which I may have neglected to, is that Gareth operated the camera. So, oh. yes. So th this this so is an important component. He's definitely very hands-on visually then. He is literally and physically hands-on with the visuals. Right. <laughs> um, and, and this really came from, from Gareth's first film, Monsters. And I think that you know, I know from from them having talked about it with me that Greg and Gareth had initially bonded when when Greg went in to interview for for Rogue One, they had bonded over monsters, and I think Greg was just really blown away by what Gareth had managed to accomplish. It's a great film. Uh, on that film, it's a great film, and a film that was made like the methodology of making that film is incredible. It was basically right. made with a crew of maybe six or seven people, um, and Gareth was the cinematographer editor, director, producer, uh, and did all the visual effects on his own, by himself, solo, in wow. After Effects, like on his computer. And they shot on a wow. prosumer camera at the time. They shot on the, the Sony EX-1, I think. And Gareth was operating that camera. And it was shot entirely in natural available light, like pure guerrilla style, truly like driving around Central America and um, Belize and Guatemala and Mexico and like hopping out of a van and paying a farmer 20 bucks and being like, hey, can we, f like you're, they're just driving on the road and they see some amazing farm on the side of the road and they pull over mm -hmm. and like, hey, can we film here? Can we film a scene here? Like that's how they made that movie. I mean, it was pure guerrilla style and like really, really ballsy and really risky, but it paid off because it's a great film. It's a great uh, film, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it has this scope that's way bigger than its budget, which was like $300,000 or something like that. So... Greg and Gareth, I think especially Gareth, but but Greg was really into this idea, was wanted to tap into that filmmaking style for this film, like at yeah. least that filmmaking approach. Now, it's on a bigger scale. We had an $80 million budget, not 300000 So, But it was this idea of like, how can we take the best of the indie guerrilla filmmaking style and approach and combine it with the advantages and support and, and sort of resources of a larger budget film, but kind of meet in the middle. Because mm -hmm. the issue with when you have too much money, 
is that things are very slow and inefficient, and there's a lot of redundancies and inefficiencies on big budget films that end up take you know ballooning your budget from eighty million to two hundred eighty million, right. and and we just knew that with an original uh, film not based on IP, not an adaptation, not um, a sequel, like you're not going to get two hundred million dollars to make this film, even though the scope of it could totally fit with that budget range. So right, it was but like it's a very contained we... film with the with the very defined ending. Yes, exactly. But um, but the scale the scope and scale of it is huge. So yes. it was like, how do we do that with under a hundred million dollars? And and this was really the answer was like we make this film as much as we can like monsters, but with more resources and more time. So part of that equation was Gareth operating the camera. And the mm. reason he does that is because on Monsters, like that filmmaking style, which is very um, intuitive and reactive, and you could almost call it documentary style, but it's it's more, it doesn't look like a documentary, it still looks cinematic. But it's a documentary approach. It's an idea of embracing uh, natural light, available light, real locations, um, creating scenarios where actors can really live and exist in a space yeah. and less so thinking about a film in terms of individual shots and doing like, okay, now we're going to get this shot and now mm -hmm. we're going to set up this shot. So let's set up the dolly and let's light this angle. And like that setup can take 15, 20 minutes. And when you're taking 15, 20 minutes to set up an individual shot, you're probably getting 30 shots a day, maybe like if you mm -hmm. do the math, like there's only so many, so much time in the day we were getting like a hundred shots a day because, and, and you couldn't even really measure it like that because we would shoot long takes like 30, 35 minute takes. And within each take, there are like 20 shots because Gareth yeah. is moving around constantly and he's reacting to what the actors are doing and reacting to the space and reacting to things that are happening spontaneously in the moment. So it was, it's just a different filmmaking approach that level of spontaneity required Gareth to, to operate the camera. So now I, I'll go back and answer the, the original question, which was like, what did it actually look like on the day? So we would show up to a location. Now, obviously we spent all of prep heavily um, scouting and um, discussing each scene and each location that it was going to be shot in um, and looking at where our hero angles are, where the locations look the best, what do we need to do lighting wise to augment any of the locations we were shooting in, figuring out basically all the logistics, like what does special effects need to do? Where's the base camp? Where are the costumes? Where's the, just figuring all that out. Right. The goal being that on the day when we arrived at a location, we had already set it up to the best of our capacity to be a playground for filmmaking with no restrictions and no limitations so that Gareth could go in with the actors and basically just start kind of figuring out what the scene is. Now he's coming in with ideas and the actors are coming in with ideas and they take a little bit of time at the top of the day to talk through that, do rough blocking, the type of thing you would typically do on a film. Yeah. But, but then instead of saying like, okay, we've blocked out the scene. Now we're going to start with the, this wide shot that was on our shot list. That's typically what you would do. What we would do is Gareth would pick up the camera and start filming. And, and there isn't necessarily like, okay, we're doing this shot first. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, we have, we have the blocking. The actors know what they're doing. We know the setting. We know uh, me and the, the lighting team have lit the space in a way that is flexible to basically 360 degree filming. Mm. And we're just going to start shooting. And Gareth has a handheld gimbal that he can move around and react and, and kind of fish around for shots and look for interesting angles and react to what the actors are doing. And that's how we would build out the scenes. It was like from the inside out, as opposed to from the outside in, like we need to get this, 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 and this shot. It right. was more like, let's discover the shots and discover the moments and discover those um, handoffs and the, the compositions and the shots like spontaneously in the moment with the actors and in the space. So that's what it looked like every day, basically. And it wow. was just very loose and very spontaneous and we're adjusting lighting on the fly um, and sometimes adjusting set design on the fly, like reacting to what Gareth is doing and where he's going. And, and th that we would just build the scenes that way, you know, and you, you build and build and build. And, and after a few hours, you basically have the scene. It's, it's more of a sense of discovery, it sounds like. It is. It is. And it's not going in purely fully blind. Like, I just want to emphasize not. that yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. It, 
it, it, it's intentionally like there's a lot of work. All of the prep work was done to set up these the circumstances where this kind of spontaneity was possible, basically. Right. Um, but yes, it was really a sense of discovery, and and it was really about freedom and spontaneity, and the 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 goal that what we're looking for is authenticity, like what we're looking for is moments that feel truthful, yeah. with the actors, with the uh, locations, with the scenes, with the space, because when you're um, when you're in a fantasy world, you're a, you're in a sci-fi world. There's already so much suspension of disbelief that you're asking an audience to to give you that. I think the goal, especially for this film, was to make it feel as grounded as possible and as real and authentic as possible. Yeah. So all of this was to, was for that. Like all of this was to that end. And I think it was, uh, yeah. I think it paid off. I think it, it, it definitely it definitely felt that way. It felt like um, like sci-fi with dirt. You know what I mean? Like sci-fi yes. is normally clean, but it, it felt like sci-fi with dirt. The the camera felt more grounded than uh, you would normally see in a film like this. That was exactly the goal. The 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 um, the clean antiseptic artifact, like artificiality was the enemy basically. Right. Yeah. You know, and you're in an artificial world. That's the challenge mm -hmm. is that you're already in this fantasy world with costumes and props and sci-fi and all this. So it's like, how do you make that not feel artificial? How do you make it feel organic and grounded and gritty and dirty and lived in and, and like a real place. Uh, so yeah, that was, it was all to serve that goal. Well, how did that style of filming change the way you lit? Um, it would lit a set. Well, it, it required us to light a space as opposed to a shot, which mm -hmm. is, is actually typically the way that I like to light anyway, and it's also the way that Greg likes to light. Um, but I think it just sort of forced us to, to do that to kind of an extreme level um, because typically even when you're lighting a space, you know, you're still using lights. Like you're still putting lights, like movie lights in the ceiling or out a window or out of frame. And we did do that in, in some locations. Yeah. But in other locations, we really wanted to embrace natural and available light. And, and I mean, I think our stated uh, goal was we would always ask ourselves whenever we would approach a location, like, does this location have enough? Maybe we mm. don't need to do anything at all. On its and own, that would, right, right, right. Yeah. Yes. And that would kind of be the best version of it is like a purely naturally lit, truly authentically um, you know, availably lit location. Now, oftentimes that's unrealistic and you show up to a location and maybe the lighting looks great, but there's like windows on both sides. Right. So you're getting this kind of flat lighting. But in that scenario, all you need to do is black out one side of the windows. Mm. And then suddenly you have contrast and you have an arena and a playground where you can get beautiful lighting and it's, it is natural light. It's a bit, we're not adding anything. We're just subtracting some things or maybe we're you're turning augmenting. off like a few bulbs. Exactly. It's, it's augmentation. And it's, and the word that I would always use is curation. It's like, mm. we're curating the available light. We're curating the locations so that right. it, it, it feels unlit. Like it feels, uh, like it's naturally lit, but it also looks cinematic and it looks elevated and it doesn't, right. it's not just, it's not just flat. It's not just sloppy. And the, the, the lighting, it was constantly riding this razor's edge. Like we would always talk about the razor's edge. And on yeah. one side of the razor is something that feels artificial. It feels too lit. It feels too perfect, too placed. But on the other side of it is sloppy and it doesn't feel curated enough and it doesn't feel contrasting. It doesn't feel cinematic. And it was constantly finding, finding that balance and finding that middle ground where we don't want to do um, too much, but we don't want to do not enough. Uh, and so it was tricky. I mean, some locations we had to light from scratch. Like we would show up at a location and look at the available light and realize like, you know what, like there's a nightclub location, uh, that shows up in a few flashbacks. Yeah. And we shot that in a real club in, uh, Phuket, Thailand. Oh, that's and the, tough. the, yeah, well, and the, so the lighting there was terrible. <laughs> like yeah, no offense is, to, <laughs> No, I've I've, yeah. I've shot things in in nightclubs before, and it's it's yeah. always just horrible lighting. Exactly, they, they they don't want you to see what's going on in a nightclub, you know. They don't want you to see, but also like the stage lighting that they had was really tacky. I mean, I I feel bad of like insulting this place, but you know, it's like a touristy nightclub in Phuket. Like it's not it, yeah. your, it's not the classiest place. It's not in the a world. place that has lighting design, basically. No, exactly. So what we did was we brought in a lighting designer. 
from Bangkok and we like designed this beautiful stage lighting array like from scratch and we had a pre-light day where we set it up and we we set up practicals around the walls and on the tables like we basically just lit the space from scratch but everything that I just described like the whole lighting in that space was practicals right because you could you you could shoot in any direction because all of the lights were lamps practicals lamp, uh, uh, lights on the tables and then the um the moving kind of dancing like uh, stage lights. So mm -hmm. all of that could be filmed. Like all of it was, there were no movie lights here. Um, but we did have to kind of build that lighting ourselves from scratch. Right. So it just depended on the location, but that is a really good example and description of like how we approached it. Cause it was more about lighting a space and like creating these opportunities for lighting than it was about lighting individual shots. Um, and we also had a, a get out of jail free card, which was the, um, uh, we had a, light that our best electric Nancy would operate on a boom pole. And so this was like, whenever we would move in for a close up and Gareth would kind of land on a shot like this, she would bring in the, the she would just bring light. in the little light. She would bring nice. in the little light. So every time we're in a nice close up, we know, and we can feel confident that like, okay, well at least we'll have a little bit of something just to give it that definition. But, right. but again, it was tricky because it was very easy for it to look saucy and, and false. And, and so we had to figure out like the right combination of brightness and distance. And often we would bounce that light instead of shining it direct because the bounce light looks more organic. It looks more um, uh, like it's from the space as mm -hmm. opposed to a light source. Um, so yeah, I was constantly navigating that, but, uh, but she was mobile, you know, she was, she had the boom pole and she was moving around and Gareth was moving around. So it was a dance between her and the, and the camera. If, if you watch some of the BTS, there's some footage behind the scenes footage from the film, uh, eagle eyed viewers will, will see her, uh, <laughs> kind of chasing her, him around. And, and I mean, you see a lot of footage of Gareth with the camera, but if you look behind him, often you'll see her with the light, either waiting on standby or she's in there and kind of navigating with him. Like it was, it was this whole dance and it was constantly moving and, and fluid. That's very interesting to, to, to work that way with the, with the light on the boom pole, basically trying to figure it out as the camera moves. That's so interesting um, yes. to even be able to do that. Yes, um, it kept us on our toes. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You're, you're constantly shifting and adjusting and curating the lighting in the frame, like often live, like during a take. I mean, we, right. wouldn't, we wouldn't shift it or move it around while an actor was in the middle of a performance, but because the takes are 30 minutes, there's little breaks in between, like Gareth kind of puts the camera down to like give a note to the actor and there's maybe 30 seconds right. where we can go in there and adjust. And, and so we, we, we constantly had to be on our toes in that way. And, um, it was, it was very invigorating. It, it definitely, it was not a, um, sit back and kind of like light the space and then let the, let the shots fall where they may type situation. Like we were constantly adjusting. Right. Um, yeah. So I want to, I want to shift to technology because everybody is talking about you guys mm -hmm. shooting on the FX3, which I really do not care about at all because I've, I've shot on, you know, Alexa's I've shot on reds. I've shot on Sony's I've shot on all different types of cameras. And I, I feel as if I can get a good look out of any camera that I'm working on, but yeah, I do want to know where you feel technologically the industry is going. Cause this is different for, even though it's not, you know, uh, $200 million film to shoot an $80 million film on an FX three is very different from, you know, what you would normally see. So wh where do you feel the technological side of things are going in f as far as cinematography? I can certainly speak to where I would like the technology yeah. to go. <laughs> I want to talk to you for a second, because one of the things that I hear the most about these podcasts and the videos that I put up online is that I have a nice voice to which I say, I do. I even had one person once leave a comment asking me if I do any voiceover work. And unfortunately for you, I don't. But fortunately for you, our sponsor for this episode does. And that sponsor is Voice123. Now, for all of you disappointed that I don't personally do voiceover work, Voice123 has a large database of people that do. And it's really simple to use. You just go to voice123.com and browse their library of voice performers. And you can even listen to samples of the voices so you can make sure you're getting exactly what you're looking for. Now, they have voices from all around the world. And once you find them, all you have to do is contact them and then pay. It's really that simple. So, no, 
You can't have my voice, but you can have many, many more with voice one, two, three. Some would even say better. I mean, some would say. So head on over to voice123.com to step up the quality of the voiceover work in your videos, your films, your advertisement, and whatever else you could possibly need voiceover work for. Again, that's voice123.com. And now that that's out of the way. I can certainly speak to where I would like the technology to go. <laughs> And, and, and then I don't know if the industry will follow because, um, it's interesting. I mean, different cinematographers have different, uh, sensibilities and different priorities and not just cinematographers, filmmakers. I mean, there's still a lot of filmmakers out there shooting on 35 millimeter film. In fact, a lot, yeah. I saw, uh, you know, every year, um, somebody does a breakdown of like the, um, 40 or oh, yeah, the, however the, many the, like the, Oscar the Academy, buzzy yeah, what cameras yeah, movies they shot on, yeah. and the yeah. cameras they shot on. And this year, I think, I, I, I mean, I, I might be talking out of my ass because I, I haven't actually checked this compared to past years. But from my memory of the past few years, I think this is the first year in a while that we've had like kind of a, a, a wide gap majority between um, the, the most films being actually shot on 35 millimeter from that, mm -hmm. from that group. And then you start going down the list and it's like, okay, there's a fewer that were Alexa, Venice, and all the typical stuff that you see. So there's quite a few movies this year that were that were kind of in that category, in the Oscar buzzy category, which is arbitrary, obviously, but that were shot on 35 millimeter. And um, Well, it's a good it's a good indication of where the industry is. You know? Yes. And it's just to say that people have different priorities. For me, right. the issue with not the issue, but the, the the my hesitation with that is just the size. Is like 35 millimeter cameras are huge, and uh, not to even mention you know 70 millimeter and IMAX and and some of the yeah. other stuff that people have been shooting on this year, and those films look amazing. Like don't get me wrong, but um, to me, what's exciting about something like the FX3 and the way that we made this film is the idea of the cameras getting smaller, because the while maintaining a high image quality. And I think that those two things are going to continue to happen as the cameras are going to get smaller and the image quality is going to get better or at least r remain the at the, the high level that it is right now in something like the Alexa or the, the Sony Venice. And the FX3 mm -hmm. obviously is not as quote unquote good as those cameras. It's, it's good enough. I mean, the imagery obviously is at enough of a technical uh, level and quality that it, ho it holds up in, in a movie theater. But... Um, you know, the Venice is 8.6K and the FX3 is only 4K. So if you need to, right. to oversample for um, readjusting your frame size or whatever, the FX3 doesn't give you that flexibility. And it's limited in frame rates and it's limited in bit depth and it's limited in all these other little technical things. But I think those things will improve. And the big advantage of it and really the reason we shot with it was the size and, and the, and the mm -hmm. weight. And that is what was exciting was being able to shoot on something so nimble and so small that you could, I mean, our whole approach of how to shoot the film wouldn't have been possible without a camera that small because we, we carried um, eight of them and each one was set up in a different configuration. Mm. One was handheld, one was on a gimbal, one was on a, a little dolly, one was on a, on a scissor crane, one was on a drone. And we had them all ready at the same, at all times, like they were all available. And so you could, um, you know, set up a shot and then while the dolly's being set up, you could grab the handheld camera and get another shot because mm. it's, it's, it's just, it takes no time at all to just pick it up and start rolling. And then you put it down and then the dolly shot's ready. So now you switch over to the dolly and you shoot that shot and then you cut and then you send the drone up and it's already waiting and ready to go. And that speed, like that efficiency of filming and that nimbleness is just not possible when you have a big chunky camera. Like it's just not possible. The, not the, at that the, speed, no. No, the size and the um, cumbersomeness of the gear slows you down, and and that's okay. Those are that's a compromise that we all consciously make when we use that right. equipment because we because we're using it for the reliability and for the quality. But I think everybody realizes that there's a compromise there in terms of time, and and efficiency and speed and nimbleness, and we like cut right through that inefficiency. That was one of the big inefficiencies that on a, on a film of the scale that Greg and Gareth wanted to like cut through. Right. And uh, yeah, so, so I hope and I'm excited by the idea of more 
cameras of cameras getting smaller, basically. But but the flexibility and um, and image quality and uh, availability of different features g g continues to go up. And you know the next step, which is already happening a little bit, is to remove the need for physical media and be able to shoot cameras uh, that are sort of streaming their data directly to a capture drive wirelessly. Mm. Um, because now you can make the camera even smaller because you don't need right. a media slot. Uh, and, uh, and you don't need to reload. You could, you know, if you had enough hard drive space, you could just, you just keep shooting forever. Uh, right. so that's, I, I hope another direction that things are going and there's already some technology with, um, uh, camera to cloud, uh, um, frame IO and some other, um, companies that are exploring that route, but it, it's still early days, but yeah, that would be, uh, that would be a cool direction for things to go. So your, your, your goal is to, or not goal, but your, your dream would be to have, you know, less equipment, smaller equipment and, and be able to just move faster and be more efficient rather than having, you know, a look come out of a certain camera that's, you know, 50 years old or something like that. That's a hundred percent right. And, and the same goes with lighting, by the way. And, and we really yeah. embraced, um, new, newer lighting technology on this using, um, you know, quote unquote prosumer lights. We use a lot of aperture mm -hmm. lights and Astera and these are all lights that are, uh, battery powered, lightweight, low footprint, low power draw, and they can all be operated off of like an iPad. I mean, they all they work right. on a local wireless network. And uh, and we used a few others. We had this Roscoe DMG Dash, which is this little LED light. It's like about that big. Uh, and um, yeah, and that also it just same thing. It, it just opened up this world of of efficiency the the biggest commodity like the most important and precious thing on set is time yeah and and time on set is so fleeting and every minute that gets eaten away that gets taken away from time where the actors are acting and you're capturing footage and you're capturing shots is is a horrible feeling it just feels yeah. terrible you're on set you you're you're halfway around the world you're you're you know 4000 miles from home in this beautiful location the sun is in the perfect spot the actors in this amazing costume by what a workshop you have all this crew you have special effects you have all these things and and then you're like why aren't we shooting like why aren't we shooting all the time why can't we just film as much as we can for as long as we can and take advantage of this scenario because it's so fleeting and anything to me that helps that, 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 that gives more time back is something that I'm interested in. E efficiencing at all of those processes. The camera, the gear, less gear, smaller gear, more lightweight gear, less lighting. Um, all of that just contributes to letting an actor and a director have more time. I always tell people light is light. You know, if you can get good prosumer lighting and you can augment it and change the quality and the shape and everything like that with, you know, support gear, why not do that rather than, you know, trying to get a big 18K that'll cost half your budget, you know, on some smaller jobs. Yeah. And, you know, that's all you have. Yes. That's the that's the efficiency that we need to be working with. That being yeah. said, though, if, if, a, if, a, if a filmmaker, say... Uh, uh, Hoyt and, and, and Christopher Nolan broke up and Christopher Nolan wanted to work with you and, and shoot 70, would that, you know, how would that change your perspective on that? Oh, no, of course. You know, you, at the end of the day, we work for the director and, and uh, anyone would, would jump at that opportunity. What's interesting, by the way, is that despite the camera, Chris and Hoyta work this, this, the same way that I just described with lighting. Mm. And they, they have a very efficient lighting uh, workflow that is designed for this exact purpose, which is to maximize the filming time. And then that's how you yeah. are able to shoot um, a movie like Oppenheimer in, in 55 days, which right. is crazy. How many, how many days was, was the creator, by the way? 90. Crazy. For yeah. what, what you guys did, for all yeah. of that? that it still feels crazy. like it's, 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 it's a short amount. But when you look at something like Oppenheimer, I just rewatched it because uh, it was re-released in IMAX. And I, I saw it again, and I, I've only seen it on film, actually. Oh, fantastic. I went to see the digital. I, I saw it on film the first time, so I was like, I want to see the, the, the DCP version of it. 
in IMAX. Yeah. It looked it looked great, but yeah, the seventy uh, uh, millimeter fifteen perf IMAX is there's nothing like that format. It's yeah, I, totally I saw unique. It but three times IMAX seventy. Uh, yeah. Awesome, but but when you look at that movie, it literally is like I was thinking that this time when I watched it, I was mm. like, I want to see their uh, schedules. Because mm. because it's it's kind of wild to me that you could shoot that movie in fifty five days, uh, that seems like nothing. And that's that's actually, um, you know, you say you say Hoyt and, and Christopher, Christopher Nolan worked that way, but uh, that's I've I've heard uh, Janusz say the same thing. Yes, with Spielberg and I've, exactly he, he lights the space. Um, I've heard you know Paul Thomas Anderson is doing most of his own cinematography now, but he does a similar thing, lights the space. That's um, exactly right. And all of that is, is, is for the goal of maximizing the time. Be, and once you maximize the time, you can be more efficient with it and shoot for right. fewer days. But it's interesting. I mean, all of these technologies and all of these tools are giving us more and more opportunities to maximize the time. Even something like an 18K, like sometimes you need an 18K. Of course, sometimes uh, you need to overpower the sun. <laughs> exactly. But... I, I hope, and, and this is already happening, that some uh, emerging technology companies and LED technology can usurp mm. the, the current limitations of um, tungsten and HMI-based systems, which are very efficient, very good, but they're outdated. And mm -hmm. they're, um, they're cumbersome. They require a lot of power draw. They're heavy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it's like, can LED you know, step in and kind of fill this gap, this efficiency gap where the, with these other lights are, are, are lacking. I mean, HMI is like, you can't dim an HMI really. You have a little bit right. of wiggle room, but if you want to cut down the brightness, you have to start using scrims. If you want to change mm -hmm. the color, you have to start using gels and all that stuff takes time. And it's way less efficient. That it's way, less yeah. efficient and it's less, and it's less flexible. And so RGB LED that are all ba battery powered and run off of an iPad, extremely efficient. They're not very bright, but here's another place where the FX3 came in. ISO 12,800, which we shot right. most of the film at. And really? We did. Yeah, yeah. Um, except for day exteriors, we shot pretty much everything at 12,800. Uh, wow. All of the interiors and all the night stuff. And what that does is it, it allows you to, like, for example, there's, there's a, a few night exteriors around the AI lab raid. Like, they... They kind of land on the jet copter and they go through the fields and then at the, later they come out of the little hatch and there's a big field with uh, where all yeah. the people are running. So that was a that was a huge exterior location. I mean, this is like multiple square miles that you can see in in different directions. And right. because we're shooting at ISO twelve thousand eight hundred, we're able to light the that whole valley with um, aperture twelve hundred D lights. Wow. We had four, we had four of them and we had them up in, in lifts in kind of strategic spots. And those lights run off of a little putt putt generator because they only draw mm -hmm. 1.2 amps, um, or 12 amps. I, I'm bad with, uh, the, uh, electronics. That's why I'm not a gaffer, but they, they have very <laughs> low power drives. So it's a 1200, um, watt light. Um, and that's enough to light up a whole night exterior when you're at 12,800 ISO. In fact, it was too much. We had them dimmed down to like 10%. Wow. Like at 100%, with just with those lights, it was too bright. Um, wow. So, but, but that's the thing. They're getting there with the LED technology, you know? With, with They're getting there with the LED technology, but also the camera technology, the more these sensors become sensitive, the more the high ISOs become usable. Gap, yeah. Exactly. And clean and not too noisy. So... Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. The creator's amazing, but I also want to talk to you about you and your filmmaking and <laughs> your your uh, journey here. You know, I watched yeah. every short that you have on your website. Oh my gosh, all <laughs> phenomenally shot, by the way. And if if for for all the listeners, everybody watching on YouTube, if you guys haven't seen it, go to his website. He has amazing work on there. It's really beautiful work. Thanks, but. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna, I wanna know, like, first off, before I, I leave the creator, what, what, what is, what, what was some of the visual inspiration that you guys brought to the table uh, for, for the creator? Is there anything specific <clears throat> that you guys were looking at? Yeah, I, I, the, 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 the funniest and simplest way to describe it is that the conversations that we had basically boiled down to, if, uh, if someone could make a movie that was just Baraka, the movie Baraka 
but in mm-hmm. the Blade Runner universe, it would be the perfect movie. Like hmm. a, a, a a beautiful, uh, aesthetic, curated, cinematic documentary that's all real and all authentic and, and has the, is shot in the most beautiful places in the world, but with uh, robots and spaceships and sci-fi. And that's so, actually kind of what it feels like. Now, now that you say it, that is kind of what it feels like. <laughs> that's sort of what we were going for. Like, Baraka was a huge influence. But then, obviously, there's a lot of Blade Runner in there. There's a lot of Alien. Uh, there's some Apocalypse Now, visual references. Uh, yeah. There's um, there's Akira. There's, uh, yeah, it's mostly, it's anime. And it's uh, f- genre films from the from the 70s and 80s especially sci-fi yeah there's that that specific window where um uh it there was this new film stock that was 80 asa and and there were a few films shot in that little period like alien and um and blade runner and all these that have this really unique look like the the mm-hmm. the, the levels of where the um the shadows live and like where the toe of the image lives and where the highlights live and we actually really um uh, try to replicate that specific film stock in our color grade in our LUT. So are you are you working very closely with the colorist? Very. Uh, are you okay. Very closely. Yeah, Dave Cole was our color, our main colorist at Photochem, and 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 we had Claire uh, Ianelli as well, and uh, yeah, they're on board the project way before we start filming, like early in prep, and we start mm. sending them um, test footage and. Uh, um, reference images and start to build the LUT and build the look of the film before we even start filming it. Uh, and they're involved all throughout the shoot. Excuse me. They're involved all throughout the shoot. Uh, and we have an onset dailies colorist from Photochem as well. So they're all in constant communication. And then we put the bow on it at the, uh, at the end uh, in the color grading process a year later. But uh, right. yeah, heavily involved. Cause it's, 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 it's a huge component of, of this type of um, film and this kind of look and, and also just shooting digitally in general, I think. Like the colorist yeah. is, is so essential to that. You can't just, I mean, you can, you know, shoot on set and then bring a film to a colorist down the road and, and come up with a look then, but it, it's, it's, it's just way better and it's more efficient to do it during the process. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's not how it worked on film either. You know, you typically a cinematographer and a director knew what the film stock looked like before they started shooting, even yes. though you couldn't actually see it on set you know you know what the film stock looks like you know how to push it you know exactly where you're seeing it in the dailies and dps would work with their with the um the color timers at the lab right so it's just different relationship but it was the same collaboration exactly and you're doing it all throughout the shoot but yeah so those were those were the influences we looked at gareth like i mentioned had a a ton of reference images that were pulled from Mm -hmm. all of the movies i just mentioned and a ton of other movies but also photography and concept art that was made for this film and concept art for previous projects. And just, it was Mm -hmm. a wealth of, of, of stuff to pull from. But, uh, I think as much as, as much as this is a cliche, I would say the biggest influence was Thailand and, and it was just the real locations and it was, Mm -hmm. it was showing up to these villages and, and observing and embracing the lighting that they already had. Like, the, the villages in Southeast Asia um, and cities, but it's especially something you see in the countryside when you leave the city. There's such a unique, there's such a specific look to them because they use like these very specific um, low quality uh, LEDs and fluorescents and, and lights. Yeah. And it's this mix of colors and, and, and green and yellows. And it's, it's so specific. And we just loved that, and we really tried to embrace it as much as possible. Speaking of colors, yeah. uh, that's actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Looking at all the shorts on your website, mm. um, they, they all look different, but they all look like they were shot by you, if that makes sense. Um, you know, And one of yeah. the things that I've noticed is the color, and the, your, your use of color and your use of shadows mm. in all of them are, are very distinctive. Um, is that always a conscious thing for you to, to kind of get those looks or is it more organic than that? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a funny thing. It, it, I wouldn't say it's conscious, but mm. it is, um, like it's, it's really not something I do on purpose. That's, that's just my taste. And, Interesting. and, and, and my, my taste manifests itself in the stuff that I shoot. I don't do it on purpose. Uh, but, uh, 
that's just the kind of color contrast and and saturation levels and contrast that I'm that I'm gravi- that I'm drawn towards that I gravitate towards, and uh, so it ends up having that similar look and feel. But uh, I, I'm never in a situation where I'm framing something up or in the color suite or something, and I'm like, hmm, this doesn't look enough like my look. That's not that's <laughs> not how I approach it. And it's funny because you can see this happen with a lot of DPs, and I always find it so interesting that Roger Deakins constantly pushes back on this idea that he has a style. He's like, I don't have a style. I reject the idea of a style. Yeah. Uh, and he, he's like, I'm malleable to what the directors want and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but anybody who knows his work knows that it, it has a very distinct look, especially the lighting. Right. And, and he uses the same lenses, the same focal lengths. He lights in a similar way. He has kind of go-to techniques that he uses. And it's it's like well isn't that isn't that style? And I think that the reason he he would say it isn't is the same reason that I'm saying that it isn't for me is that it's not style it's just taste. That's mm. that's just what he likes. That's that's when he's given a scene and given a space and he lights it and and frames it up and then color grades it. That's what it ends up looking like because that's what he that's what he's drawn towards. That's his taste. That's and how you see the world. That's how you see the world, exactly. And 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 uh, so, yeah. The what you described uh, that you see on my website—that's my taste. And I think Greg has his own taste, and Gareth has his own taste. Our tastes are very similar, which is why the collaboration worked really well uh, from right. the from the start, because we have very similar sensibilities and, and tastes. So uh, it yeah it worked, but it 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 is. It is something that's there. I mean, I see it. I acknowledge it. But it's never something that I feel like I do on purpose, <laughs> if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because if you're if you're thinking if you're thinking I need to fit my style into whatever I'm shooting, then you're not paying attention to the story that's taking place. Exactly. You know, you are forcing your that's that's ego. Right. That's that's you saying me is more important than this, the project, the story, right. the look, et cetera. And that's, I just reject, the, like, everybody should reject that. Any filmmaker should. If that thought crosses your mind, I, I, I go become a still photographer, you know, or, or, a, <laughs> or a painter, because that's where you can express the self. And that's not ego in a bad way. That's just, it's just about the expressing the self. But filmmaking, you, you mentioned this earlier, is, is the collaboration. It's not about expressing right. the self. It's about creating the, a project. It's, and it's a group, it's all, every film is a group project. And right, every film is a group project. Yes, yeah. exactly. So if you want to express yourself, uh, there's tons of art forms to do that. And, right. and there's nothing wrong. And I, and, and I do that myself. I'm, I'm a still photographer as well. So that's, that's where I express myself in still Interesting. photography. So you do a lot of still photography? Yeah, but it's a hobby. I mean, it's not a, I don't professionally do it. So it's more, uh, just on travels or on set, um, uh, and just in the day to day, but it is something that I, that's, a, it's, I really view it as a different outlet than it filmmaking. Is, it's a different, I, I, I do both and it's a, it's a yeah. very, they're different art forms yes. completely. There's some overlap. Um, there's, there's an overlap specifically with, cause I only really do street photography, travel photography, that kind of stuff. Like I'm not doing mm-hmm. lighting. So there is the overlap is in observing light in the natural world, which which is mm-hmm. just a helpful skill for filmmaking too. Mm-hmm. But I I almost would say that it's coincidental. Um, and same with composition, framing, lensing, all of that stuff. Like there's overlap, but it's um, right. The the art form itself, the the form of expression is different because it's individual as opposed to collaborative. Of course. I tell I tell every um, I, I I sometimes speak at schools and, and things like that and I tell every aspiring director and cinematographer they need to pick up a still camera so that they can learn how to work with light they can learn how to frame they can learn how to use lenses compose they can learn how to tell a story with an image you know I I couldn't agree more that is the one piece of advice I also always give <laughs> every time it's, it's 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 crucial it's so crucial it is and it's and the thing is is everyone has a camera in their pocket these days a really good right. camera yeah so there's and no it's so reason easy to use it's so easy to use there's no reason why you shouldn't just be constantly out there as a filmmaker and specifically a cinematographer when you're not on set like you're still you can still be out there practicing 
yeah. observation of light and observation of composition and lensing and framing. Uh, because mm-hmm. you have a camera in your pocket all the time and you're out there and you're experiencing the world. So yeah, soon, yeah, soon I'm going to hear that you put out you put out a book like uh, like Deacons, like byways uh, of your photography throughout the years. Maybe one day. <laughs> I have a lot of it on my website. I, I, I keep the photography section on my website pretty updated. So there's there's quite a few um, photos on there. That's 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 great. Yeah. Um, so. Speaking of deacons and speaking of still photography, <laughs> what are there are there filmmakers or films or photographers or painters or anything that kind of inspired you in your journey or, or kind of like drove you down a path to try something different or accomplish a look or anything like that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I I love still photographers. I have a lot of photography books um, in the blur. They're Same. out of focus in the background right there and minor, all over the shelves. Right and, yeah. And I have some, I'm actually looking at byways right now. It's on the shelf that's right here. Um, <laughs> it's right here, right yeah, next to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have um, Gregory Crudson, Beneath the Roses. I have Doug Aitken. I have um, Todd Hedo. Oh, I wow. have, um, yeah, there's, there's, a ton of, there's a ton of great ones down over there. Doug, Doug Aitken has been a big one for me. Uh, 99 Cent Dreams is the the photo book that I have specifically that I really, really love. But all of his mm. stuff is great. And um, and uh, I, I follow a lot of photographers on Instagram, like non-famous photographers, that just people that are out there kind of doing their, their Instagram thing, yeah. which is great. Uh, and painters. I studied painting. I studied uh, art history and painting. Oh, yeah, See, that explains a lot. That, yeah, that explains a lot in, about in, your about in high your school. Book. Yeah, in high yeah. school we had an art art history um, class and painting. So uh, yeah, I mean it, for filmmaking for cinematography, it's 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 the Dutch uh, painters, it's the Dutch masters. Yeah, that's, that's where and, and Raphaelites and Carva, Caravaggio. So it starts. That's where it starts. Caravaggio and Raphael and. Um, and then it, it years later, like a few centuries later, there's the Dutch painters and Vermeer and uh, uh, is the most famous one. But there's a whole movement of Dutch painters that embraced natural light and really mm. and really learned how to paint natural light and, and harness natural light. And it's contrasting. It's beautiful and it's and it's it's cinematic. It's like if you go to a Dutch painting exhibit or a or a Raphaelite exhibit or Caravaggio exhibit, chiaroscuro, at any art museum. You you will you'll look at these paintings and you'll be like, this looks like a movie. Like it looks like a movie yeah. movie still. It's crazy. Yes. Yeah. 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 I I'm, I live in D.C. and I, I often will go to the uh, National Gallery of yes. Art and just look at the paintings. You yes. Know, just because they're so some of them are so cinematic. I, yes. Um, I've often often noticed that that cinematographers that have strong connections to painters work with color and contrast in a different way than others. You know, mm-hmm. I heard Storaro talk about how he didn't fully understand cinematography until after he stood, started uh, studying paintings. And this is, this is post um, the conformist post um, all of the stuff in the seventies post uh, 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 it's, it's, I think it's post um, apocalypse now too. Mm. Um, so he didn't. He did. He he. It, when those are beautiful films. I mean, those are know? yeah some of the best shot films of all time, which is funny. Exactly. But yeah, that's also but just a sign of his humility. Totally. Yeah, yeah. He's he's being humble. True. But <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's very true. No, but painting, painting. I think studying other art forms in general just en- enhances, especially other visual art forms, enhances your cinematography. A hundred percent. And I think just immersing oneself in art in general, like obviously I watch a lot of movies and TV shows as well, but yeah. also like I listen to a ton of music and music doesn't necessarily directly inspire filmmaking uh, for me, but mm-hmm. it's um, it can inspire mood and atmosphere. And I do think that those are super important for filmmaking pacing and, and feeling yeah. like there's something very pure about music is all emotion and rhythm and pacing and like that's what filmmaking is too there's just a visual component to it as well but it it is still dealing with the same concepts of of emotion and rhythm like that's what that's what a movie is because it exists in linear time and there's a progression and there's a there's a pacing to plot progression and and story beats and emotional beats and even just a pacing to shots like physical camera movements Mm -hmm. um and it all serves the purpose of creating, uh, capturing, and eliciting uh, an emotion. So there's yeah, overlap with every is, art form. Yeah, 
pacing is just rhythm, you know? Yes. And music is rhythmic. It is, <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. Scorsese said that he can't, he can't uh, start designing his shots until he's heard music for it, you know? So that there, there's a, there, it, whatever way that people can connect and enhance their art through other art forms is, is perfect. All right. I agree. I think we're coming up close to an hour, mm. and I think I only have you for an hour. Okay. So <laughs> I want to know, we talked about some photographers and some photo books that you love, which I love because I just did an interview and, and somebody asked me what is like, I think it was like the best thing I bought for filmmaking. And I was, I was like photography books. Easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. We, we, we talked about uh, some paintings and painters that you love, but I want to know you, I want to know a few films that you would recommend that every cinematographer watches in order to just understand the art of cinematography or improve their own cinematography. The, the, this is a question I love because I am above all of these other things, a cinephile and I, I love yeah. movies and I obsessively watch movies and have for my whole life. So as you should be, yes, I agree. Uh, by the way, that's another piece of advice that I give filmmakers, especially cinematographers Same. is just watch movies and study movies. Same. There's so many cinematographers that don't watch movies and they're like, Oh, I don't There's have so time. Many, yeah. Yeah, I don't no. have time, and it's I, like I, make time. What do you <laughs> make time? I, I I do a movie a day, a movie a movie day. A day. Is, is yes, how, I try. That's I how try. you got to do it. I, I I miss a few days because there I do get busy, but most exactly. days I'm watching a movie. There is still life happening, but sometimes some days I'll watch two movies. <laughs> yeah, on some the good days, days on, I've, I've I've done three or three. four. In yeah, the exactly. Yeah. I was like on a good day. On a good day, I'll watch like a weekend with nothing to do. I'll watch three movies. Yeah, uh, yep. easily. But uh, yeah. The American Society of Cinematographers did all of us a huge favor. And a few years ago, they did like a member survey. Mm. And they compiled a list of 100 most important films to watch for cinematography. And that list exists on the ASC website. And it's in chronological Ooh. order. And I think it starts from Sunrise, Song of Two Humans in uh, 1927. And it goes all the way up to... Uh, uh, in the Mood for Love, I think, is the most recent film on there. And there's obviously, there's Beautiful. there's more recent films to watch as well. But there's 100 films between uh, 1927 and 2000 that are on this list. And a lot of them are yeah. classics. A lot of them are films people have already seen. But there's a lot of films on there that I bet people haven't seen. And so my biggest thing to advise a cinematographer who's like, wh what films should I watch for cinematography? Is like, go to that list because that is the list that is the expression of that, the answer to that question when it was posed mm -hmm. to the entire ASC membership. It's like, this, this, is, wow. this is the best cinematographers in the world um, telling, answering that question. These are the most important films to watch for cinematography. So the, the, that's, that's are probably- Are there any standouts an, for you? Yes, th th and that's probably a be better resource than what I can provide from my own perspective. Now, from my own perspective- no, that's, a, that's a great answer. That's yeah. a great, great answer, actually. From my own perspective, uh, the, 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 the most beautifully shot films personally for me are, um, Blade Runner, mm -hmm. Alien, mm -hmm. Seven, mm. um, Baraka. Baraka is beautiful. And, uh... I gotta put one more in there. Recently, it's uh, Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Like I think that's probably the mm. best shot movie in the last 20 years. Mm. And then like a classic, like if you go further back, it's um, it's probably like The Red Shoes. That's a great one. Yeah, or, or, or one. Black Nar Nar Narcissus. Also great, oh man. Yeah. So it's it's one of the I can't I can't hone it into one, but it's 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 one something in that in the Powell and Pressburger world. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna it, say the red shoes. I'm gonna say the red shoes. Any any, but before I let you go, is there anything specific ab about those films that you're really drawn to as far as cinematography goes? It's everything we've been talking about. It's colors, contrast, camera movement, composition. They're just the sort of ultimate amalgamation of the art form and they're they're all yeah. they're very painterly and they're very dynamic and yeah i just i just love them <laughs> i just oh. love everything about them they just and it goes back to taste and it's like those they the, that's 
those are just the films that um, align with with my taste. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Have you seen and all have of informed the my films taste. on the Have informed my taste. Have, have I you, seen all 100 seen films? All films I would need to go through the list again. Probably not. Yeah. There's probably one or two that I haven't seen. But um, yeah. I don't want to sit here and confidently say that I've seen all of them. But uh, I've probably seen 98% of them. <laughs> yeah. If not all. Maybe I'll go through the list and I'll, I'll double check and, and, and check myself. But um, yeah, there might be one or two. There's always one or two films you still haven't seen. Always. I, I did. My friend and I, um, obviously, last year, the Sight and Sound poll came out that which they do once every yeah, 10 years uh-huh. and and there's a uh there's a bunch of films on that that i haven't seen and we my friend and i made a list there's like probably 12 or 15 films uh and we've been trying to kind of make our way through them they're all on criterion channel and they're all they're all accessible but uh yeah there's still some kind of big like classic uh uh legendary films from from cinema history that i haven't seen that i i need to check out like um, uh, Pather Panchali and uh, there's some Ozu films I haven't seen. Um, mm-hmm. I've never seen Tokyo Story somehow, even though I've seen other Ozu really? films. What? And, yeah, there's like there's some big. I have some big uh, gaps to fill. I, I only saw Tarkovsky like in the pandemic. I, I had seen a few films. Wow, but I, really? I, I had never seen Andrei Rublev, and I had never seen um, uh, um, Mirror and. Uh, so in, in the pandemic, I, I was like, I need to, I need to go, I need to go back and fill the gaps because there's a few that right. I hadn't seen. And so Criterion Channel came in clutch and I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a Michael Mann, um, completion now because oh, Ferrari's fun. coming out and there's a couple Michael Mann films I've never seen. I've never seen Thief. I got to see Thief. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You, you know, the most embarrassing one that I haven't seen, I have never seen The Wizard of Oz. That's, That's like pretty crazy. <laughs> That's that's the most embarrassing one that I've never seen. Because that's like an all time classic. That's I not know, that's I know. not like a cinephile classic. That's like a I know. <laughs> Listen, I know. Hot and take. Good movie. <laughs> Good movie. Good movie. Very hot take. It's a very, classic very for take. a reason. It's a classic for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, oh, look, I, it's it's been so many years at this point. I'm like, ah, nah, I'll, I'll watch it later. <laughs> ah, I, you guys are making it up. It's just not that good. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly, no. exactly. And I'm a, I'm a big cinephile too. Like I said, I watch a movie yep. a day, but I yep. haven't gotten around to that. So, but everyone has the everyone has those gaps, and we gotta we gotta we gotta. That's there's listen. We have our whole lives to watch movies, and the classics aren't going anywhere until uh, right. I don't know someone. Uh, takes down the Criterion channel and then we'll be doomed. But for now, they're <laughs> going will be strong. doomed forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Here at Film Crux, we're known for helping filmmakers take their films and videos to the next level, which is why we're proud to announce Film Crux Plus, every Film Crux product for just $10 a month. Sound design, Foley, cinematic music, VFX assets, and more, all in one place. Your films will never be the same.